Order members, it's time now for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Uh, Deputy Minister, we will start with listed questions and I call Sean Rogers. Question number one. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jennifer McKeon to answer this question. The Bright Start School Age Childcare Grant Scheme aims to create or sustain up to 7,000 school age childcare places in low-cost social economy settings. These will begin to address current unmet need for school age childcare services. There were 77 applications received under the first round of applications for the Bright Start um, School Age Childcare Grant Scheme, which closed in May. A second call for applications for the new, the new um, child care uh, scheme projects will end on the 30th of September 2014. The Child Care Partnership Strategic Funding Panels have assessed the 77 applications and agreed that 50 met the selection criteria. The settings that will be funded will sustain 1,165 school-aged child care places and create 326 new school-aged child care places. The 50 successful applications represent funding of some £1.9 million to be paid over a three-year period. All 77 applicants to the grant scheme have now been advised of the outcome of the assessment process. No setting new or existing was required to deliver its places by 1 September of this year, but we would expect most of the settings funded under the first call to be operating by the autumn. All of the 40 child care settings that are currently financially assisted by OFM DFM have applied for funding under the grant scheme, and those that were successful will continue to operate when their current funding ends on the 30th of September this year. I call Sean Rogers for a supplementary. Could I thank the junior minister for, for the response? Can OFM DFM confirm the number of new places that are available at the start of the school year? Say how many are rural based, how many are school based, and how many based in social enterprises? Well, I, I haven't got the exact figures are for, for the, the different um, sectors that you, you mentioned, but I can say that, that they would all be social, um, from the social enterprise sector. And the reason that is, is because we are very, very, um, we're very clear that any surplus monies that are reinvested for, for more service provision, that we wanted to go into more service provision to create more places and not for the distribution for owners. But I will get, I can assure the, um, the member that there are a number of those childcare places that are, that are in a rural setting. I just don't have the exact figures here, but there are a number of them also in the rural setting as well. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Junior Minister what public consultation her department has undertaken uh, with regards to the Westminster proposals to replace the childcare voucher scheme with tax-free childcare payments, and why her department believes this new scheme will be better for families in Northern Ireland? Well, as you said, you know, the coalition government does propose to introduce a new scheme to provide financial support to help working families with the cost of childcare. And uh, again, the purpose of the new scheme is to enable those with responsibility for children to take up paid work or to work for longer. Um, I have to say that, that you know, we, we are in the process of looking at the scheme. Um, there has been no sort of definitive consultation that has happened yet, but we certainly will be looking at all, because uh, part of the Bright Start um, is to actually, we, what our proposals want to do is to actually ensure that all people, all parents and all carers are actually informed of all the, the, the schemes that are there, both in terms of the uh, uh, child care element of uh, tax, working families tax, but also and the, the vouchers also. So we part of that uh, child, part of the bright start is to actually do that. So we will be looking to to roll that out. I call Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask uh, the minister how much of the 12 million budget for childcare is currently unallocated? Um, well, we have heard this, uh, but I have details here of you know the the, the, the 12 million pounds. In 2011 to 12, £3,222 was allocated to the fund. In 2012 13, £1,482,000 was allocated from the fund. And again, in um, 
2013 to 14, 692,000 was allocated from the fund. Now, I can give the member details, um, but I wouldn't have the time to go into it here. But I do have the details of where those specific allocations are. Um, and I think that, that, that you know, if, if you want, I can write those to you. Um, as I said, there's like. Uh, in, the, in the last year, their uh, play board got £6,552,000. £6, there was £40,000 to the Department of Health. So that was all going towards, um, towards delivering childcare services for um, people in the local communities. But as I say, there's, there's quite a, a, a detailed um, amount there, and I'd write to the, the member to give them that. Moving on, I call William Irwin. Question number two, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Phoenix uh, project was originally set up as an umbrella group with a number of uh, outlying offices which, while retaining their individual identity, worked together. The original Phoenix project had seven local offices spread throughout the north. However, some of the local groups have now applied for funding under their own corporate governance uh, arrangements. Not all the individual groups receive funding from VSS, some only receive peace funding. The total VSS funding for groups who were originally within or came under the umbrella of the Phoenix project in the 2013-15 period is £420,198. These groups are located in Armagh, East Tyrone and West Tyrone, as well as the overall Phoenix group which operates throughout the north. All victims groups, the Victims and Survivors Service and the Commission for Victims and Survivors have been asked to find 4.4 per cent efficiency savings in administration. This has also been applied to our department and all its arm's length uh, bodies. I call William Irwin. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his response. Uh, the Phoenix Group, uh, uh, as I am aware, uh, is in need of gap funding from uh, September uh, to April next year. And there's a significant number of offices that will close in the absence of that. Uh, and given the importance of the Phoenix Group's support to victims, will the Deputy First Minister give an assurance that every effort will be made to find the gap fund needed uh, that they may continue the work they're doing? Well, the, to date, the Victims and Survivors Service has been given a budget of £10 million for 2014 to 15. Uh, a bid for additional resources has, uh, was not met in the June monitor, and this has created pressures. However, I am optimistic that the VSS budget will be restored to its 2013-14 baseline position of 11.3 million following October monitoring. Uh, the Victims and Survivors uh, Service, as I have said, have been asked to seek to apply 4.4 efficiencies from the running cost of the service itself and from the groups funded under the Victim Support Programme. This is in line with the level of efficiency savings uh, which have been sought by our department from all our arm's length bodies and from within the department itself. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the, the Deputy First Minister. I'm seeking clarification. He talks of a 4.4% reduction across arm's length bodies, including the Victims and Survivors Service, and he talks about the current budget being 10 million. Uh, I understand from a briefing from the VSS their budget this time last year was in excess of 12 million which means the current reduction is in excess of 15%, not 4.4. Would he confirm those figures are correct? Well, I, I can only uh, go on the figures that I have been supplied with, and given your contribution uh, to this discussion, I, I certainly check those figures that you have provided to the Assembly today. I call Dominic Bradley. Ta kesh to gum don las kidara a dachel groupi ibertak a vrish termi a good litzrak ofrala. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what action has been taken in relation to victims groups which have found to be in breach of the terms of their letters of offer from SEUPB? Well, I think that these are matters which are obviously under uh, constant review. There have been a number of cases over the course of recent years uh, where there has been uh, investigations uh, conducted to ensure that funds that are being provided out of the public purse are being properly 
given to those who are most in need. So I think that the uh, responsibility of all groups is to work with a, a good spirit of cooperation with officials and with the Victims and Survivors Service to ensure that uh, there's no misappropriation of funds. Where there is any, alleg any allegation of misappropriation, they will, as always, be investigated. I call Sandra Overend. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 3 and 13 together. Funding for victim services has increased over recent years, with £50 million being allocated for victims during this uh, budgetary round. We fully acknowledge that the needs of victims and survivors is an important legacy of the conflict, and establishing the Victims and Survivors Service was an important aspect of focusing on need. As demand increases, we need to consider the supply of services and funding available to deliver them. Due to the restricted financial climate, uh, we have allocated the Victims and Survivors Service £10 million at the start of this year. Of course, we always want to meet demands, which is why we have made a bid for additional funding in the October monitoring round. And as I have said earlier, I am optimistic that the VSS budget will be restored to its 2013-14 baseline position of £11.3 million, and accepting uh, that uh, an other member has introduced uh, a caveat which challenges those figures. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's, it's important to say that we are still pleased that the importance of finding the additional funding was acknowledged by the Finance Minister in the Budget Paper and agreed by the Executive. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. It's uh, 40 years since the beginning of the Troubles in Northern Ireland and only last year did we have the establishment of the Mid-Ulster Victim Empowerment Group in Mid-Ulster, which aims to support the victims of terrorism across the whole constituency. Um, but yet they are dealing now only in their, in their first full year of, of running off a severe cut to their budget. What can the Office of First and Deputy First Ministers do to reassure the victims of terrorism in Mid-Ulster that their needs will not be forgotten and instead will be supported for quite some time to come? Well, the, the, the responsibility to deal with the situation in relation to all victims falls upon uh, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister and arm's length bodies. Uh, and I think, as I've said earlier, we recognise that uh, at a time of economic hardship and uh, cutbacks, and I think people have to remember that the cutbacks are directly as a result of the strategy being adopted by the present coalition government in London, where in fact uh, the First Minister and myself met with our own finance people just last week, and it clearly indicated to us that since 2009, and this is now 2014, there has been no appreciable increase whatsoever in our block grant. And given inflationary pressures, uh, given the need to meet uh, the, the financial uh, consideration of uh, workers and so forth, that inevitably places a huge burden on the distribution of funds and as a direct cause of the challenges that we as an executive and the finance minister faces as we deal with uh, the economic situation right across all government departments. But as I've said in the course of this contribution, uh, the victim sector is a very important and special sector. Uh, we do have a duty and a responsibility to ensure, even in the face of the very difficult climate uh, economically that we face, to ensure that those people who have suffered as a result of conflict uh, will be supported. And that's why in the course of uh, the October uh, monitoring round, we are pledged to try to uh, ease the difficulties which many of these groups, uh, including the group in Mid Ulster, are facing. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Deputy First Minister confirm whether or not um, Catherine Stone, who, who previously was the Victims Commissioner, is um, playing a role in um, appointing a new Victims Commissioner and how he can um, assure people in the victim sector, certainly the innocent victim sector, how they can um, 
I believe that she um, is fit to take that job, given the fact that she referred to the current victim's service as not fit for purpose. The, the member has clearly gone beyond the funding issue, but the Deputy First Minister may wish to reply. Well, uh, the member is, is correct. The, the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, Catherine Stone, left her post on the 12th of June 2014. Uh, our officials are currently working through the processes to appoint a new Commissioner. The appointment will be regulated by the Commissioner for Public Appointments and will follow the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments. Uh, the process will be taken forward by HRC Connect and advertisements have recently appeared in newspapers. The closing date for applications is midday on the 12th of September 2014. The Victims and Survivors Forum was consulted on the skills and qualities needed for the role and were taken into consideration when finalising the necessary skill sets for the incoming Commissioner. And the First Minister and I took a view, given the highly respected uh, person that Catherine Stone was as Victims Commissioner, the huge amount of support that there was for her within the victims sector, that uh, the experience that she gained uh, while she was here would be invaluable in ensuring the uh, successful process of appointing a new uh, Victims Commissioner. So I think that uh, everybody who worked with Catherine, uh, we were receiving regular reports, uh, had nothing but the fullest uh, admiration for the way that she conducted herself while she was Victims Commissioner. Uh, and I don't think that there is any unease within the victim sector about the role that she's playing in relation to the appointment of a new Victims uh, Commissioner. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, In the Minister's response, he indicated that uh, funding for victim services has, had increased over recent years. Can the Minister give an indication of the level of this increase? Margaret. Well, uh, as I said, the, the First Minister and myself have allocated £50 million pounds for victims during this budgetary period from 2011 to 2015. In the previous budget period from 2007, to 2011, 33 million was allocated for victims. The current victims' budget, therefore, is 17 million pounds higher than in the previous budget. That represents more than a 50% increase. Our current annual budget for victims sits at around 11.3 million. Under direct rule, in the three years between 2004 and 2007, the victims' budget totaled 11.8 million. Our annual budget for victims is close to what victims receive for three years under direct rule. So I think that those figures speak for themselves. The support of victims is a huge priority for this executive, and it's a huge priority for the First Minister and myself. And we will constantly ensure against the backdrop of what is a very harsh economic climate that uh, victims are supported as best as we possibly can. And I think those figures clearly show the commitment from the Executive and from the First Minister and myself. I call Alex Atwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It might be useful, um, uh, Deputy First Minister, that you would confirm what you've just said, that given the unfortunate comment that was made by the member opposite in respect to Catherine Stone, that it was a decision of both you and the First Minister that she should play a role in terms of the appointment process. And at the same time, could you confirm that given that this time last year Catherine Stone formally alerted you and the First Minister in respect to her concerns about the VSS, that both you and the First Minister are personally monitoring the implementation of the very wide-ranging recommendations that arose from the report that was commissioned after she formally alerted you and the First Minister as to her concerns? Well, I, I think anybody that worked with uh, Catherine Stone uh, didn't have anything other than the highest regard for her capabilities and indeed her compassion for victims. But she was also someone that was very much an advocate for victims and someone who was uh, always prepared to discuss with the First Minister and myself the challenges that the victim se sector uh, were clearly facing. So I think that the uh, advice from her is all, was always taken very seriously indeed. And I think as a result of some of the things that have happened within the BSS sector over the course of uh, recent times in terms of uh, resignations and so forth, uh, there obviously is a huge challenge to ensure that the needs of victims are being properly catered for. 
there have been some outlandish allegations made over the course of uh, the last while, uh, which the First Minister and I have totally and absolutely refuted as being without foundation. But I think we will continue to face into those challenges, as will the Victims and Survivors uh, Service and uh, the new Victims Commissioner, to ensure that we are delivering for all victims <coughs> of the conflict. Moving on, I call Rosie McCorley. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. The Executive's Child Poverty Strategy Improving Children's Life Chances was published in March 2011. In 2012, the Executive launched the Delivering Social Change Framework to tackle poverty and social exclusion. This framework established a mechanism from, for cross-departmental action delivering social change signature projects which have been launched to target action where it is most needed. In October 2013, we published the Child Poverty Outcomes Framework, the result of several years of work to develop a model in which every department can understand its role in tackling child poverty. A review of the current child poverty strategy was carried out from October 2013 to January 2014. We subsequently published a consultation document delivering social change for children and young people <coughs> Pardon me, in January 2014, which aimed to integrate the child poverty strategy into a wider strategy to improve outcomes for all children and young people. <coughs> the majority of consultees welcomed the proposals. However, some of our stakeholders wanted more time and engagement to develop an integrated strategy. We have taken the views of our stakeholders fully on board and have decided to lay a separate child poverty strategy and to engage further with stakeholders in the development of a new strategy to replace the 10-year strategy for children and young people post-2016. We plan to lay a child poverty strategy for 2014-17 following committee referral and executive consideration this autumn. This strategy is informed by the consultation and the child poverty outcomes framework. I call Rosie McCorley for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for the answers to this point. Um, can I ask the Minister um, if she can outline any concerns she has with respect to austerity measures and in the predicted rise in levels of child poverty? Yes, can I, I just tell the member I'm very concerned about the predicted rise in child poverty levels as outlined by a recent Institute for Fiscal Studies report carried out for OFM, DFM and also a similar reporting that came from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has shown that families with children are being the hardest hit right across Britain by welfare cuts. And again, um, you know, in terms of that report, they actually said that the child poverty levels here will actually rise to 30.9% and 38.5% respectively in terms of relative and absolute child poverty. And again, we have seen, you know, in, in terms of uh, in Britain, the way welfare cuts is affecting families, particularly families with children. And we have even more families here that have children and we have uh, families with a larger amount of children in them. And the, the Children's Commissioner's Office also, in reports that they commissioned, indicates that the North, because it has a relatively large proportion of households with children, with also uh, higher levels of children with disability, will lose more income than any other region um, outside London. So we're very, very concerned about the austerity uh, measures of the coalition government and the proposed welfare cuts. I call Dolores Kelly. Hey, Deputy Speaker, and I'm... Uh, pleased to hear that the junior minister with responsibility for children and young people is very concerned of the uh, findings of the reports. But is that not uh, whether an indictment of your childcare uh, anti-poverty strategy? And exactly, minister, what are you and OFM, DFM going to do about it? Well, as I said, you know, yes, um, the concern, we are very, very concerned about it. And, you know, I, I understand that, you know, that even now, you know, when we're, we're seeing the, the, the people, the increase in people, families using food banks. We're seeing an increase in crime in supermarkets where people are actually stealing, stealing food. And I can I say that there are some, there's, uh, there has been some work that has been, um, you know, brought forward in terms of different departments. OFM, DFM, for instance, has made funding of 13.56 million available over three financial years from 2013. Um, to employ an additional 230 re recently graduated teachers through our 
delivering social change. We have developed the framework of delivering social change to actually to ensure that poverty is tackled in a holistic way, that all departments have a responsibility for, for poverty. Indeed, every member in this House has a responsibility for tackling child poverty. And there has been, we, I mentioned earlier in one of my questions, the first phase of the Bright Start Child Care Strategy, which was launched, the grant scheme is out there already. Uh, actually creating those child care places and sustaining the ones that are already there is actually working towards poverty. We have DARD who, who, uh, who actually works also in terms of, of the, their poverty um, framework. So there is a lot getting done within departments and the executive, but are you asking me is it enough? You know, I think we all need to, to be doing more and I think that as we go forward that everybody working together on the Delivering Social Change Framework needs to do that, all departments. I call Basil McRae. Uh, could the Minister explain the difference between relative and absolute child poverty, and could she comment upon whether absolute child poverty has been improving in recent years or not? Well, relative poverty is whenever you have uh, your 60 per cent below the income of the average household income. Um, absolute poverty and our persistent poverty is when you are actually in that type of poverty um, totally. And I think that, that you know, what, what, what the member is saying, I mean, you can measure the levels of poverty, and that's what we're trying to do with this new poverty strategy. We're trying to ensure that the indicators are outcomes-based as opposed to figures that are just massaged, if you like, because in terms of the, 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 the in slight decrease in child poverty over recent times, that actually is a result of that average uh, household income actually be coming down as opposed to any impact being made on child poverty. So we're very, very you know, uh, much uh, wanted to do the child poverty outcomes to see. And uh, I mean, poverty, uh, when you're measuring child poverty, it's not just about the household income. It's about educational underachievement and educational attainment. It's about health inequalities. It's about all those other things, access to play, access to services for children. So we're, and you also need to look at the whole family when you're looking at child poverty as well, because we can't see it in isolation. So that's, that's what we're trying to do with this new poverty, anti-poverty strategy or child poverty strategy. And I call David McElveen. Question number five, please, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann also to answer this question. The Delivery Social Change for Children and Young People consultation document was published in January 2014. This sets out proposals to integrate the child poverty strategy with the 10-year strategy for children and young people and to work to deliver our commitments under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Consultation closed on 31 March and an analysis report was compiled. While most respondents welcomed the proposal, some stakeholders wanted more time and engagement with stakeholders to develop an integrated strategy. We have listened to our stakeholders and have taken their views on board, and we are proposing following committee referral and executive consideration to lay, as I said earlier, a separate child poverty strategy 2014 to 2017 in the autumn and allow the 10-year strategy for children and young people to continue until 2016. We propose to work with stakeholders using a co-design process to develop a new strategy for children and young people post-2016, and this work will begin shortly. I call David McElveen. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Junior Minister for her answer. Uh, junior Minister, if my memory serves me correctly, one of the key objectives um, of delivering social change for children and young people was that of improving literacy targets amongst our children. Um, with the scenario that you have now painted um, of uh, some further consultations to take place, um, where do we see um, improvements um, even in the last six months since this um, scheme was launched um, in literacy targets for our children and young people? Well, I can tell the member, I actually um, was out, and myself and Junior Minister Bell, we actually visited a number of schools where, where the, the teachers, the newly graduated teachers had been employed to actually, um, through the Delivering Social Change signature programmes, and even talking to those teachers, um, they could see the improvement within the classroom, within you know, the, the, child's, the child itself, but also within the, whole, the, 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 school, uh, set, the school environment also. Um, so I think there has been a lot um, you know, uh, of positive um, feedback from that. I think that there is obviously there's um, still out for consultation. 
Um, but I do believe that in terms of the educational attainment, with, which the member um, is actually asking about, I think we have seen you know, uh, those achievements. 260 teachers you know, are employed to actually, and it's a focused, targeted approach on those children that need the actual support within, within the classroom. So I think that, that you know, we're seeing that. And we're seeing it right across the board with some of the signature programmes. But I think you need to go out there and actually see it and actually talk to the teachers and talk to the children and indeed talk to the parents of the children also because we've also done that. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on for uh, 15 minutes of topical questions. And I again call uh, Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. De Deputy Speaker. Um, Christians today are suffering greater persecution in the, in the Middle East and in Africa than, than ever before. What is OFM doing to highlight this particular persecution and to improve their plight? Well, well I think that OFM, DFM, would undoubtedly share the concerns of the member in relation to what is happening in other parts of the world, particularly in relation to the activities of the ISIS group, which is uh, wreaking havoc in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, and we have seen, sadly, in the social networks and on the media, uh, the outworking of, of their strategy over the course of recent times, although I think many people in this part of the world have only become familiar with the Islamic State organization in the course of recent months. I'm told that they have been in existence for much longer than that, and we're particularly active in Syria. I don't think we have any uh, illusions about our ability to affect the activities of a group uh, so many thousand miles away. Uh, I think that uh, the powers that be in the world uh, are obviously uh, contemplating how this should uh, be dealt with. But uh, I have a very strong view that the uh, in invasion of Iraq uh, provided uh, the opportunity for many groups in, in Iraq and in the surrounding region to uh, plunge Iraq into uh, ev even worse turmoil than it was under Saddam Hussein. And uh, I attended a, a Chamber of Commerce lunch in, in Derry where uh, General Stanley McChrystal, just recently, who led the U.S. participation uh, in Iraq, uh, made, uh, I think, a very compelling uh, contribution uh, to the debate. When he sat down beside me at the uh, lunch table, I asked him if he had been president of the United States, would he have authorized the invasion of the Iraq? The minister's two minutes and has said, been completed. I just finished. He said, not in a million years. He said, Iraq is worse now than it was then. So we have only got a, a limited ability to uh, I call Sean to deal with these for situations. Thanks, to, uh, Deputy First Minister, for his answer. And I know we only have a limited ability, but what discussions have taken place at governmental level with the British or with the Irish to ensure that maximum pressure is applied at an international level um, to, to stop those that are financing these organisations? and ensure that uh, the, the, the people are, are, are looked after? Well, I have to be very honest. I, I don't think that the, the powers that be that are dealing with these situations give one hoot for what uh, our executive or this assembly feels in relation to how that matter will be dealt with. They are obviously dealing with the situation from uh, their perspective. And, and as, as an observer, uh, I think I, with many other people, wonder uh, whether or not they have got a, even the foggiest notion themselves about how they deal with that situation. Uh, the reality is that uh, whether these groups are funded or not, it, it's quite clear that they are well organised. It's quite clear that they have been in existence for some time. And it's quite clear that they are totally ruthless in terms of the process that they've been involved in, particularly in recent times, which have been well articulated, where they go to people and tell them that they have to change their religion. Of course, we're all, uh, we're, we're all really, uh, I think, annoyed and angry that people, not just Christians, but others from other religions, are being threatened, intimidated and murdered in this way by ISIS. 
but uh, th this is something way beyond us, and uh, we shouldn't have any illusions of our ability to impact on a, a situation that world leaders themselves appear to be uh, struggling with at this time. I call Karen McKibbitt. Thank you, Deputy uh, Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Deputy First Minister to explain uh, to the House why there has been no written reply um, to the Lord Chief Justice's concerns regarding Minister Poot's remarks about not getting a fair hearing at the Court of Appeal? Well, I mean, I think the, the member, uh, and, and I suppose the media should know better as well, they must know that the Office of First and Deputy First Minister is a joint department. It requires agreement. And uh, it, it's no secret to anybody in this House that the First Minister and I would have, have uh, a different view uh, of the remarks made by uh, Minister Poots. Not just by Minister Poots, but by others, even in the course of the last uh, couple of days. Uh, my sympathy is totally and absolutely with uh, Sir Declan uh, Morgan. Uh, and I think that uh, the sooner the matter uh, is resolved, the better. And, uh, we are involved in discussions at the moment in an in a, in a effort to try and uh, get uh, an, an agreed response to what uh, Sir Declan has said. I call Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Deputy First Minister, uh, has he any plans to lodge the Chief Justice letter uh, into the Assembly Library? Well, I haven't even considered that, but as a result of your question, we, we will give a consideration, yes. Moving on, I call Lord Morrow. Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the uh, Deputy First Minister today, there's been a lot of questions raised around the lack of funding for victims' groups, and we've heard what he has had to say in relation to that. Could he update the House in relation to the Social Investment Fund? Should we be concerned about it also? <coughs> Well, I mean, the, the Social uh, Investment Fund, uh, the process is up and running. Uh, projects are in motion. Uh, I think that from our perspective, we are satisfied that the money uh, that we provided for that was ring-fenced, and uh, we're confident that, that at this stage that the process will continue to a successful conclusion. I call Lord Morrow. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer, but could I ask him further in relation to the distribution of the funding? I understand that that fund was approximately £80 million. Pounds. Is he telling the House today that he is quite confident that there will be a full distribution of that, and has there been a full application for that amount of money? Well, whenever we made provision for uh, the funds for these vitally important community-led projects, uh, we did so on the basis that the full funding of 80 million will be provided, and we are uh, attempting, in the face of great challenges, to stick to that. Uh, it is very, very clear from the proposals that have come forward from the uh, different uh, sectors of, of the North that, that there are many projects out there. In fact, you could spend another 80 million and another 80 million ten times over uh, fulfilling the. Uh, requests that have been made from what are community-led projects. So we are satisfied at this stage that suitable progress has been made and that uh, we will very, very soon uh, begin to see the, uh, uh, the construction of some very important projects which will aid uh, the community in different parts of the north. I call Rosie McCorley. My Concordia. Can I ask, would the Minister be aware that while there is an ongoing inquiry uh, into historic institutional abuse, that there are others who fall outside of the terms of reference of that inquiry uh, who wish to be included? Uh, Junior Minister McCampbell, deal with this question. Yes, um, we're very aware that, that there are a number of people who fall with, uh, outside the remit of the inquiry, and obviously, you know, we're, we're very keen to, to make sure the inquiry continues. Um, um, and actually, you know, the, the, we have we do we have had consultation with a number of people, for instance, um, women who were over 18, who when they when they entered an institution aren't covered by the inquiry. And indeed, anybody in the wider clerical abuse, you know, um, that, that worked in an institution aren't covered. But we're certainly very, very keen, and we've asked our officials to bring forward some recommendations. And, and 
to look at them. I've also written to the, the judge, judge Hart, who is the head of the inquiry, to see if there's some way that we can. Um, he's, very, he, he, he's actually very, very adamant that he doesn't want to widen the, the terms of reference of the current inquiry, but if there's some way that we can indeed to look after those, those women, particularly that were over 18 at the time, because I think you know, we, we, we deserve to, they deserve justice and truth as well. So we're trying our, our best to try and, and look at that. I call Rosie McCorley for supplementary. Guramai August, alas, Concordia August, Gumbuya Selection Naira, Asan and Regrishin. Can I ask the minister if she is aware of comments made by Naomi Long in the media uh, this morning, and what would her views be on those, Guramai August? Yes, um, again, I can't tell the member. I'm very aware of um, the, the statement by uh, Naomi Long over the weekend. She put a statement out, and she was saying that that more people have actually contacted her in recent days in terms of uh, being abused by members of the British State Forces here in the 1970s. I te will tell the member that we have asked um, uh, for um, a meeting with um, Ms Long to, to discuss that, but also we want to ensure that any of those women that have come forward that they are covered and that they will have, um, you know, they will be able to, in, in some way, avail of the, the, the services of the Historical Institution Abuse Inquiry, and indeed the ones who, who won't, because, you know, and, and I don't want to, to go into it in great detail, but we obviously have seen the way the, the British state has actually spent decades here covering um, up the activities of its intelligence service here in Ireland, and we've seen it more recently in terms of, of the cover up around the Concora. Um, institution, so we're very, very keen to, to talk to Ms. Uh, Long first and to see if there's any way we can help those women that have came forward. I call Old McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, September the 18th is the Scottish referendum on independence. Um, has the First or Deputy First Minister uh, any, uh, uh, taken any uh, view in relation to? the British Irish Council and what the implications might be if, in fact, uh, the vote were to go for independence? Well, uh, obviously there's going to be a lot of focus over the course of the next uh, 10 days on what is happening in Scotland. And uh, no doubt we will all, in the aftermath of, uh, of that vote, uh, depend, of course, on which way it goes, have to deal with the uh, implications of all of that. And the implications, no matter what we do, could be quite <coughs> profound, as uh, many of us will know listening to the debate in the course of uh, recent times. Uh, we haven't been involved in any discussions, uh, because to do so would be to preempt the outcome of the uh, decision of the people of Scotland. Uh, I myself personally have very consciously uh, stayed out of that debate because I think what is happening in Scotland is a matter for the people of Scotland to decide about outside interference. So I have no intention whatsoever of uh, contributing to uh, a view uh, which in any way would undermine the uh, rights of people there to make their own decision. I think what we will do is we will wait for the vote and uh, whenever uh, the people of Scotland decide, whatever way they decide, then we'll have to deal with the fallout, but uh, we won't be the only people dealing with the fallout. I think that uh, you know, it's, it's quite obvious that both the British and the Irish government are very focused on uh, what is happening there and conscious of their responsibilities in the aftermath of whatever decision is made. I call Old McGuinness for supplementary. Thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. I do understand the position that there hasn't been any discussions to date. But in the event of a result one way or the other, uh, would it not be incumbent upon the Office of First and, De First and Deputy First Minister to enter into discussions with the Edinburgh Government in relation to the outcome? Because there will be implications no matter what way this vote goes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the comments made by First Minister Alex Salmond in the course of the last few days where he has said that whatever way it goes, he will remain a, a true friend of ourselves here in the North. And I think that in all of our dealings, First Minister and myself, uh, with him he's always been very 
uh, positive and very constructive in the course of the British Irish Council meetings, the Ministerial Council meetings and the Joint Ministerial Council meetings which we engage in uh, in uh, Westminster. So I think the sensible thing for all of us to do is just to wait uh, the outcome of what undoubtedly will be a very, very important uh, decision. And in the aftermath of all of that then, whatever the uh, outcome is, we will engage in whatever dialogue and conversations need to be had uh, with, the, uh, with the British government, I suppose, in particular, in terms of how we go forward. <coughs> And that is the end of questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we now